How many of you are excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Man, I tell you what, it just seems like the worship just is progressing and progressing and progressing. We're getting closer and closer to the heart of God. And man, it's just a powerful thing just to come together as a community, just lift up the name of Jesus and make him famous in this place, to see and experience his presence. You know, his presence is what transforms lives. Amen? It's what transforms lives. It's not an eloquent message or words being spoken. It's just the Holy Spirit moving and working. And I can sense God just doing more and more and more. And man, I cannot be more excited about being a part of what God is doing here in this place with us as a church and as a body. We are in a series right now called The Church I See. Uh, We started this back about four weeks ago. Uh, The first week, Pastor Eric brought the message on the mission of Journey Church, which our mission is this, to see our cities transformed by the power of the gospel for the glory of God in our generation. Now, in order for us to fulfill this mission, we have a vision to do so. Our vision is this, to build a community of people that is life around the presence of God. We want to do life around the presence of God. How does that happen? As we gather here corporately and we encounter his presence, then may we daily personally encounter God throughout the week. I pray that you've been doing that because as we encounter God personally throughout the week, our encounters here corporately are just going to be that much greater. Amen? Because you shift atmospheres when you've been in his presence. You see, we are carriers of the very living presence of God. And when we've been doing communion with him all week, when we've been abiding in him all week, his presence is just stirred up in our hearts and we shift atmospheres when we begin to worship him, when we come together and chase after him, amen? Uh, two weeks ago, I, I spoke, uh, three weeks ago, I can't remember, two, two, two three weeks, it doesn't matter. Uh, we talked about one of our first value, pray first. Then everything we do before we act, we're gonna pray. It's probably the most important of all the values. Uh, Last week, Pastor Joey talked about uh, the Sabbath, that uh, we want to be healthy as a community, as a church. That we're going to Sabbath, that we're going to, the way we articulate this is is pulse check. We're going to check our pulse. Have you been going 110 miles an hour? Have you been just trying to do things on your own? Going after the things of this world? Or have you taken time throughout your week to give to the Lord? to Sabbath, to set a day aside. If you're feeling burnt out, it might be because you haven't Sabbath, you haven't given a day to God. This morning, we're talking about the value of edification. Edification, this is how we articulate this value. Speak life. We see people the way God sees people. We call it destiny and others by speaking life and not death. I want you to repeat this with me. Can we say this all together? Let's go. We see people the way God sees people. We call out destiny in others by speaking life and not death. Let's do it one more time, a little louder now. Come on, let's fill this room with this. We see people the way God sees people. We call out destiny in others by speaking life and not death. And how powerful it is to be able to speak life into people. Now this really in nature, this value is a prophetic value. I want you to understand this morning that you're a prophet. You're a prophet. Now you might be saying, Adam, that might be a little too much for me right now. I don't know about that. But I want to show you very clearly in scripture that you are a prophet. Now I'm not talking about the office of a prophet, okay? The office of the prophet is found in uh, in Ephesians 2.20, which says he's given some to be teachers, apostles, evangelists, pastors, and prophets. So I'm not talking about you hold the office of the prophet. What I'm talking about though is that you're a prophet. Turn to someone right now and say, I'm a prophet. Then tell them back, I know you are because I am too. (laughs) You're a prophet. Let's look at scripture this morning. I know some of you right now are a little hesitant with this, but let's look what the Bible says. Because we want to, we want to abide and look at what scripture says. Amen. We're not trying to make stuff up here. We're going to look at what scripture says. So let's look at Numbers chapter 11 and and 1 Corinthians chapter 14. That's where we're going to be this morning. First off, 
Uh, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14. It says this, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. Verse three, but he who prophesies speaks edification. There's our value there. He speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. Verse four, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets. The church may receive edification. Let's pray together. Lord, we want to be a people who speak life into one another. We want to be a people who encourages and builds each other up, Jesus. And Lord, I know in this room that God, as we talk about something like this, there's almost a mysticism around it, but God, you never intended it to be that way. So Lord, I pray that you would soften our hearts to receive your word today, God. Your word is truth, God. Your word is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path, oh God. And Holy Spirit, we all came to hear from you. None of us in this place came to hear an eloquent message or sing a couple songs. But Holy Spirit, we have to hear from you today. So God, we say, speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Speak to our hearts, Jesus. Lord, we will receive exactly, God, what you have for us this morning, Jesus. Holy Spirit, we welcome you here. We don't make room for you, but we give you the room, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's look now at Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11. Now, right before we read this, uh, we see uh, Moses prays the prayer of what I would call the prayer of every burnt out pastor. He says, Lord, if you love me, just kill me. (laughs) I've been dealing with all these people. I've been going through all this and they're driving me crazy. So Lord, if you love me, then won't you just kill me right now? That's where Moses was at. He's in a pretty dark spot in this moment. And God said, hold on one second. Don't worry about it. I'm going to send you some help. So the Lord, he appoints 70 elders to help Moses. It's the first time that we see elders in scripture. And so God appoints 70 elders to help him. Elders really serve for two purposes. They serve to help protect the vision given to the pastor by God. So they're protecting the vision given to the pastor by God. And they help spiritually care for the people of the church. So God appoints the 70 elders to help spiritually care for the people of Israel. Back about a month ago, we appointed our own elders. And so we have elders here at Journey. Let's pick it up here in Numbers chapter 11, verse 24. It says this, so Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. The word of the Lord was that he would put elders into place. And he gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tabernacle. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him. Again, just notice that throughout scripture, God speaks to his people. God speaks to his people. It's all throughout scripture. And God, this is God, God took of the spirit that was upon him, him being Moses, and placed the same upon the 70 elders. By the way, when the elders have a different spirit than the pastor, that's when you have a problem within the church. So God took the same spirit that was upon Moses and placed it upon the 70 elders. And it happened when the spirit rested upon them that they prophesied although they never did so again. Now it's very important when the Spirit rested on them, remember this, when the Spirit rested on them, they prophesied, although they never did so again. We're gonna talk about that in a few moments. Verse 26, but two men had remained in the camp. The the, The name of one was Eldad, the name of the other was Medad, and the Spirit rested upon them. Now they were among those listed, but who had not gone out to the tabernacle. Yet they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. 
Verse 28, so Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, one of his choice men, answered and said, Moses, my Lord, forbid them. So he's saying on behalf of Moses, uh, forbid prophecy. But then Moses says this, verse 29, then Moses said to him, are you zealous for my sake? Oh, he corrects him, oh, that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. Then Moses returned to camp, he and the elders of Israel. Okay, I want to give you three points this morning for us being prophets that we need to know. The number one thing is this. Number one, all can prophesy. All can prophesy. Verse 29 of what we just read. Then Moses said to him, are you zealous for my sake? Oh, that all. Say all. Come on, say all again. All the Lord's people were prophets, and the Lord would put his spirit upon them. All of them. All of God's people. Every single one. All of God's people. He's saying, wouldn't it be nice if God would put the spirit of God upon all his people and they would prophesy? Has this happened? Where's the fulfillment of this? Acts chapter 2, and it's within context. Acts chapter 2, where God put the spirit. This is the prophet Joel who prophesied this in the Old Testament and the fulfillment of this. Verse 16, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on, what's that word? All flesh, your sons and your daughters. Okay, that's everyone. It doesn't matter who you are. You're either a son or a daughter. He will pour his spirit upon all flesh. They shall prophesy. Young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants, servants who are men, and on my maid servants, servants who are women. Again, let me explain. That's for everybody. I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. Then let's read another scripture here, 1 Corinthians 14, 31. For you can all prophesy. There it is. Right there in the Bible. There it is. For you can all prophesy, one by one, that all may learn, and that all may be encouraged. So all can prophesy. Notice the words there, you can. So you can all prophesy. So God says you can prophesy. So let me give you a biblical definition of prophecy. Prophecy is this. Prophecy is giving a message from God to someone. That's all it is. So doesn't it make sense that if you can prophesy, then you can all hear from God? If you can prophesy, and that's what the Bible says, the Bible says that every single person, all, all of God's people can prophesy, then doesn't it make sense that you can all hear from God? Imagine uh, for a moment uh, Pastor Eric or, or Rob Price telling me, hey, all you men in this room, you need to make sure you're at Man Church Saturday morning at 8.30. Everybody going to be there? Who's the man? Come on, men. You're going to be there? So that would imply, though, that I heard them tell me that, right? So when you say, the Lord spoke and he told me, it implies that you heard from God. Now, I also don't want to discount that there's a human element in all this. We can miss it. But what I want to make the point is this. If God says you can prophesy, then you can all hear from God. Now, I want to show you something about the 70 elders, Numbers 11.25, which we read earlier. The Spirit rested upon them, and they prophesied, but they never prophesied again. Here's why. Because the Holy Spirit came upon them, but didn't remain. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is this. It's when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and remains. Now, Jesus was the first one to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Check this out, John 1.33. John the Baptist is speaking and he said, I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit, watch, watch this, descending and what? Remaining on him. Not just descending. So here we see in Numbers 11 where the Holy Spirit descended upon the 70 elders You also see Saul, where the Holy Spirit descended upon Saul, and he prophesied, but he never did so again. Here, 
the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus and remained. Now, when I say the Holy Spirit remains, it doesn't mean, though, that we always yield to him, right? But what it does mean is that he's always with us. There's this Greek word used to describe the Holy Spirit throughout Scripture, and it's this word, parakletos. Para means alongside, kletos means to come. So the Holy Spirit wants to come alongside of you. The Holy Spirit wants to come alongside of you. So imagine this. Imagine you go on a walk with your spouse, and you're walking with them, and it's a beautiful day. It's 75 degrees outside, but you never say a word to your spouse. Wouldn't that be weird? The Holy Spirit is walking alongside of us. He is constantly trying to speak to us. If we would just open our ears to hear him, amen? He's not trying to play a game. The Holy Spirit is not mute. He's not playing charades. Hey, two words, first word, four syllables. He's not doing that. He's not a third base coach waving you home. He's not playing a game. He's coming alongside of you. He wants to speak to you. Jesus said it clearly in John 16, 13. He said this, however, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority. but Whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. When he comes, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will speak. He will tell you things. He wants to speak to us. The Holy Spirit wants to speak to us. I remember when I heard the Holy Spirit when I was in the middle of, a, of worship when I was 15 years old. And the Holy Spirit called me into ministry and called me to be a worship pastor and a pastor. And I knew in that moment that he had done that. And then for the next year, two years, three years, I knew that. But along the way, I would get at different times, different points in my life, I would get prophetic words from people, different people who didn't, had no idea. They even had, they had never heard me sing. They never heard me play guitar, never heard any of that stuff. And they would prophesy over me as a young teenager that I was going to be a worship pastor. And I remember that. It gave me courage inside of me to go after what God has already spoken over my life. And I value that so much, and I'm so thankful for those people who heard the voice of God and took the voice of God and encouraged me with it. That's what we're doing. We're encouraging one another. Now, point two this morning, this is very important for you to get. Prophecy, though, is not manipulative. Amen? And some of us in this room, we've seen it manipulative before. And so we're putting up a barrier, a wall, even right now. Say, I don't want to receive this. This is, this, is, this is different. This is weird. But have we seen someone abuse it? But God is calling us to do this healthy, to do this in the right biblical way, amen? So prophecy is not manipulative. Prophecy is not telling people what you want them to do. It's not going and saying, hey, I feel this inside, and so, hey, thus saith the Lord. By the way, there's no reason to talk in New King James, y'all. There's no reason to talk in New King James. That's not how, or King James, that's not how God speaks. Just be normal, right? Be normal. You can say, or, or they say, hey, God told me to tell you. Listen, uh, we're going to get into this. Let me read some scripture before we get into it. Jeremiah 23, 25 through 26. I have heard, this is God speaking, what the prophets have said who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long will this be in the heart of the prophets who prophesy lies? Indeed, they are prophets of their own, uh, of the deceit of their own heart. Jeremiah 23, 30 through 31. Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, says the Lord, who steal my words, every one, from his neighbor. Behold, I am against the prophets, says the Lord, who use their tongues and say, he says. They use their own feelings, they use their own emotions, and they say, God says this, God said this. Ezekiel twenty-two twenty-eight. her prophets plastered them 
with untempered mortar, seeing false vision and divining lies for them, saying, thus says the Lord, when the Lord had not spoken. So please, as we walk in this, please, please, please be careful. You can prophesy, but be careful. You're not just going after your own emotions when you're making sure that it's uh, this really God speaking to you. I think it's actually better to do something like this. To say to, uh, if you feel like you have a word from the Lord for someone, you say, hey, I was praying for you, which implies that you were praying for them, not praying against them or trying to manipulate them. (laughs) You were praying for them. I was praying for you and I felt the Lord say this to me, and I'd like, just like to submit it to you. I'd just like to submit this to you. What, how, how, let me tell you what I feel like God says. Let me tell you what, he, what I feel like God is doing. Does that kind of bear witness with you? Yeah? So that's how an appropriate way of giving a word to someone, especially when you're first starting, when you're first learning and growing in this. Let me give you also a new understanding of, of the third commandment. Um, I think it does mean what we believe that it means, uh, that we're not to use the Lord's name in vain, that we're not going to use the Lord's name as a profane word. It does mean that. But maybe a different even me- a meaning that I would like to submit to you, that word vain there is selfish, selfishness. So you're not using the Lord's name for selfish gain. So we're not going to use the Lord's name in vain for our own selfish gain. We're not going to say, thus saith the Lord, or the Lord told me to tell you when it's for our own selfish gain to manipulate someone. Let me show you another uh, verse when operating in prophecy, 1 Corinthians 14, 39. Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. So many of you in here, you might have a, uh, again, a heart that says rejecting this because you haven't seen it being done decently and in order. That's what God's saying. So it's never manipulative or to get our own way. Prophetic in tongues should be done in decent order, the Bible says. Now, for us as individuals receiving a word from God, receiving a prophetic word from someone else, to guard against manipulation, 1 Corinthians 14.32 helps us. It says this, And the spirits of the prophets are subject... To the prophets. So when someone comes to give you a word, you need to have your antennas up. You don't need to have a critical antenna, though. You need to have a discerning antenna. Is this really God speaking to me? Does this bear witness with what the Lord has already told me? Many times in my life, almost 95% of the time, I've already heard what the person's telling me. And they'll look at me and they'll give me the word and they're expecting me to act all surprised. I'm like, cool. This is edification. It's, it's just, it's just uh, confirming what the Lord has already told me. That's all it's doing is encouraging us, which leads me to point three. Prophecy is edifying. Amen? It's edifying. It's encouraging. It's edifying. It's speaking life into someone else. 1 Corinthians 14.1, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. So we have three actions in this verse. Pursue love, desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Pursue love. Pastor Eric, the first week, he talked about the mission of the church, and he used uh, to see our cities transformed by the power of the gospel for the glory of God in our generation. And he used the greatest commandment of all, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and to love others. Listen, this message this morning is just a cherry on top of it all. If we don't have love, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the chapter before this says, if you don't have love then, and you can prophesy, you can speak in tongues, then you're just a clanging symbol, church. If we aren't pursuing love, if we aren't loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we're not loving our neighbor, what's the point in prophesying? We have to pursue love first. So pursue love. Pursue love. Desire spiritual gifts. And especially that you would prophesy. 
So I want to ask you a question by a show of hands in this room. How many of you are going to commit yourself to pursue love? Are you going to pursue love? Let's be a church that pursues love, pursues love first. Yes, amen. You put your hands down. I'm going to ask again another question. How many of you are going to desire spiritual gifts? Are you going to desire spiritual gifts? You're going to walk in them. Yes, amen. Now, it's biblical here. You know the question I'm about to ask you. It's biblical. It's in the Bible. How many of you especially desire that you're going to prophesy? That we'd be a church that builds one another up. Imagine what would happen if we were building each other up, if we were edifying the body of Christ together. Man, look at verse 3 here. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. That's what you were doing. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. I had a, uh, someone come to me one time and they said, I-, I received this word from someone. And ever since they gave me that word, it just, uh, I haven't been able to sleep. I've been in turmoil. It just, uh, I-, I don't know how to receive it. I'm just, uh, I-, I-, I don't know how I feel. It's just this terrible feeling came over them. And I asked them the question. I said, uh, does it edify you? Does this word edify you? And they answered no. Does this word that they gave you exhort you? They said no. Does this word comfort you? And they said no. And I said to them, well, it's not God then. It's not God. What does it say? If it doesn't edify you, exhort you, or comfort you, it's not prophecy. That's what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to build you up. Now, does God use people to correct you? Yeah, but it's more than a natural, I believe. It's, it's maybe your, your spiritual authority or uh, a, a spouse even sometimes, which we don't like to hear that sometimes, do we? Or someone else in your life to help bring correction to you, but don't call it prophecy because that's not what it is. That's not prophecy. What does prophecy do? It it edifies you, exhorts you, it brings you comfort. But don't call it prophecy if it's not one of those three things. So everyone's heard of uh, Paul and Barnabas. They were uh, some of the most famous missionaries that we could see tandem in all the Bible. And uh, did you know that Barnabas was not named Barnabas by his, uh, his mother or his father. Uh, Acts chapter 4, 36, it says this. And Joseph, other translations say Joseph, uh, which means exalted, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement. Son of encouragement. So by his mother and father, he's named exalted. But because he was such an encourager to people, the apostles renamed him Barnabas because he encouraged people. He edified people. He built them up. Amen? I want to ask you a question this morning. What name would your family and your friends give you? Would they give you a name that represented anger, or tearing down, or manipulation, or any number of things. What name would they give you? Or would they give you the name that you're an encourager? You build people up. Are you building up your kids? Are you building up your family? Are you speaking life into the people around you? Or are you tearing them down? By the way, the word encouragement, E-N there in Latin, which in English it would be I-N. So encourage means to actually literally put courage into someone. Are you putting courage into people or are you a discouraging person? May we be a people that build each other up. May we be a people that encourages one another. Let me show you one more verse on encouragement, Acts 15.32. 
Now Judas and Silas themselves, being prophets, also exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words. They edified, built up the brethren with many words. They spoke life into people. It doesn't say they rebuked, corrected, and tore down people. It says they were prophets, and they built up, strengthened, and exhorted people. Is it possible in this room that you've already moved in prophecy and you didn't even know it? Is it possible you've already done it and you didn't even know it? Because there's a stigma around it. Have you ever felt like maybe before, man, I need to uh, go tell this person this to encourage them? That's God. Have you ever felt like before, I need to write this person a, a message on Facebook just to encourage them a little bit? That's God. What it looks like is, hey, I went to go tell this person a scripture. And the scripture that I gave them was the same scripture that they read the day before. And it was as if God was reaffirming to them what he was already speaking to them the day before, amen? And you're giving that same, was that, was that uh, the devil, was it you? No, it was God. Out of 31,103 verses, you chose to give them that same scripture that God spoke, spoke to them about just the day before. That's God, that's how he works. That's how he builds up his church. Some of you in this room, you're like, man, prophetic, that's kind of weird. No, you've already done it. You've already walked in it. You've already heard from the Lord. You've already encouraged someone. And that's what we're called to do as the body of Christ is to build each other up, not to tear one another down, but to speak life, to build them up, to call out destiny in each other. I see upon you, man, this, this anointing of worship. I see upon you this anointing to preach. I see upon you this anointing to, 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 to break the yokes and the bondages of the enemy. I see upon you this anointing to serve. I see upon you this anointing to build people up. I see upon you this anointing upon your life and you're building each other up and encouraging them. We're not feeling threatened. We're not feeling threatened by each other's gifts. We're not feeling threatened by one another. That person walks differently than I do. And that's a beautiful, wonderful, great thing. If we as a church begin to walk in our God callings and begin to encourage each other to walk in our God callings versus saying, man, their calling is a little different than me. I don't know if it's, if it's, if it's right. I, and you're judging them instead of building them up. We're called to build each other up, to edify one another, to speak life, not death. And if prophecy is a word from God, and if prophecy is a word of encouragement, what does that tell you about God? He wants to build his people up. Satan wants to tear you down, but God, he wants to build his people up. And he's using field agents. He's using you and me as his mouthpiece to build each other up up in the Lord, to walk in our destiny, to walk in our callings. May we not have this, this attitude of comparison. May we not have this attitude of feeling threatened. We're feeling like, man, I just don't feel good enough. You are good enough. You are good enough. What God has placed on you is unique. You are perfectly and wonderfully made. And your calling upon your life is unique. It's very hard sometimes to walk in our callings when people haven't encouraged us to do so. I didn't plan on sharing this story, but it reminds me just in this moment right now of my, of my son. He had his last basketball game back about a, a week and a half ago. And, you know, he's, he was taller than most kids. Every time he got the ball, it seemed like he would just pass the ball to his teammates, to one of two people who always got the ball and stuff. And he's a good ball player. He practices a lot. And finally, in the first quarter, the coach said, hey, Caleb, you can dribble the ball. <laughs> you can go and you can dribble the ball. It's okay. And then he told his, his other teammates, hey, pass Caleb the ball. Now, Caleb, go dribble the ball. And the coach was encouraging him to go do it. And all of a sudden, it's like a light went on as soon as the coach encouraged him. 
He scored seven points. The entire other team scored nine points. But it only took a little encouragement. It only took, hey, Caleb, you can do this. Let's go. It was inside of him all along. Sometimes in our lives, there's something inside of you all along that God has placed inside of you, but you just need a little encouragement. May we be a people who realize the giftings of other people and build each other up. That's what God is calling us to, amen? Yeah. So our value, our value is this. Let's read it one more time. Edification, speak life. We see people the way God sees people. We call it destiny in others by speaking life and not death. Would you rise with me? Yes. Would you just shut your eyes right now? The prayer team can forward. Our prayer partners. I want you just to think with your eyes closed, what is the Holy Spirit speaking to you right now in this moment? It can be any number of things. It could be something even completely different than this message. It could be something about the message this morning. What is he speaking to you specifically right now? I want to ask you, maybe some of you in this room, you've never given your heart to Jesus before. I would be remiss if I didn't give you an opportunity to do so. If you want to give your heart to Jesus, you feel a tug at your heart right now. You feel this tug inside of you that, man, I have to give my heart to the Lord. I've never done it before. If that is you in this room, or would you just lift your hands? Lift your hand up. I'm not going to do anything to embarrass you. I see that hand, sir. Yeah. Anyone else? Give your heart to Jesus. Anyone else? Can we just rejoice for the one person who raised their hand this morning? Yes. We thank you, God. We thank you, Lord. Can we just pray this prayer together? Maybe even in this, in this moment right now, you're saying, I need to recommit my life to Jesus. And so that's you. Let's all just pray this prayer together. Lord, I give you my life. I'm not going to walk my own way, but every part of me is yours. Would you come in and change me? And would you use me for your glory? I give everything I have to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If that was you and you prayed that prayer, maybe you didn't raise your hand. May we rejoice with you. You are now a part of the family of God. Yeah. So before I pray and I close, I want to also ask you this question. What do you, what is the Holy Spirit speaking to you about right now in this moment? Is there a struggle in your your marriage? Is there a struggle that you're walking through um, with your job? Uh, It could be any number of things. Man, we're going to, after I pray, I encourage you, if you gave your heart to Jesus this morning, or if you need prayer for anything at all, our prayer partners are up here to pray for you, to partner with you in prayer. And uh, we invite you to come forward. Let's all pray right now. God, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, Jesus. That, Lord, you've called each and every one of us to build each other up. God, may it not be some mystical, weird thing, God. But, Lord, may we all walk in the prophetic, Lord Jesus. May we understand who we are in that, Father God. Lord, may you teach us. May we... Uh, especially desire prophecy in our lives, God. We want to hear your voice clearly. We want to walk boldly in speaking truth to your people, God. And so, Lord, we submit all we have and all we are to you. We thank you that your presence is abiding with us and you're moving in this place. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Can you give the Lord praise right now? Yeah. Hey, if you, if, you have a, if you have a prayer need for anything at all, please come forward, receive prayer. God bless you. We love you. Have an amazing week. We'll see you next Sunday.